Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the second episode of the Refuse to Lose podcast. My name is Kieran McGinley. Joining me is Austin Smith, and we're here to talk about sim racing and uh, all that lovely stuff. Austin, I'm looking forward to tonight. We've got an hour and a bit of uh, topics that we can all join along for. Yeah, I'm very excited to. I've been uh, having a bit of a headache earlier today, but that's all gone now. I'm feeling good. I'm having fun, and uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a great hour. You're pretty sure? How sure? <laughs> Put it on a scale. Eighty-five uh, percent. <laughs> all right. So there's always sure. there's always the possibility of technical issues of some sort. You never know. Nah, nah, nah impossible. Uh, impossible. No, no way. <laughs> um, so obviously, uh, quite a bit's happened in the sim racing scene. Um, obviously, there's uh, quite a few topics we talked about. Uh, last time we were here, it was sort of an experimental piece, what worked and what didn't. Uh, so I said to Austin, look, let's let's think of a couple of topics. I'll, I'll choose a couple and we'll see how that stands. I mean, Austin's gone away and made these lovely banners along the bottom of the screen, which I believe one of them has our Twitter handles on, plug, plug. Well, actually, <laughs> two of them. Because, two of them. Uh, one, one, for, one for each, yeah. He's, one for <laughs> each. Uh, if you wanna, if you wanna follow Kieran on Twitter, it's at ksmcgf1. You see it right there in the bottom. And if you wanna follow me on Twitter, um, it's right there. I'm, I'm not gonna try to pronounce that. I have, you, you know, I have trouble every time when we do uh, commentary together. Every single time, it's just because of that darn. I'm trying not to swear. Three, <laughs> three in the middle there. It, it just messes it all, it all up. KSMCGF1 sounds quite long. Pretty easy to repeat, you know. But yeah. this, <laughs> it's so I mean, horrible. Someone said to me, "Why does your Twitter handle sound robotic?" And it's like, well, I mean. I have to spell out my own name on a daily basis, both first name and second name. It just makes sense to spell out my Twitter handle. It's just, <laughs> just the way it goes. Hey, everybody follow me on Twitter at Kieran McGinley, spelled K I E R. Oh, yeah. Work. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's why I have it the way it is. And I am so close to 300 followers, I can almost taste it. <laughs> Uh, there's um, a taste <laughs> there is a taste there's a taste i wonder if we get three i wonder if i'll get 300 by the end of the stream tonight make it happen Hopefully. oh yeah everyone who's watching go and follow kieran Let's why get not 300 what I'm, could i, I would have to from? look i don't i don't even know where i am i'm, I'm, I'm eh, close to 1700 oh but... wow all right just, <laughs> just no wow. no just say it, just say it hurt me won't you <laughs> anyway, if, yeah, I'm, um, still, I'm still 20 away. So if you're liking in the stream and if you're joining <laughs> us for this one, make sure you do comment. Uh, we do try and read some comments. Uh, and obviously, if you want to add something to the conversation, you're more than welcome to do so. We'll pick out some clean ones uh, that we might be able to say on the stream. But Austin, you're in control of the banner. So what are we talking about first? Well, the first thing uh, is uh, the big, big question. What brought us, you and me, to commentary, to doing this that we do every week, sometimes multiple times a week. Um, at least for you, probably every week is is multiple uh, commentary gigs that you have. Uh, for me, right now, it's it's one and a half. <laughs> it used to be, like, it used to be more. I like the half. What what's the half? The half is being a reserve commentator for One Hub. Ah, uh, yes, of course. As I'm not the main, I'm not, you know, scheduled every week. But, you know, when there is a vacancy, as, for example, this Friday, I, I'm actually going to fill in for you. Well, <laughs> big shoes to fill. <laughs> it, it really is, yeah. Um, I hope it's it's going to work out fine. And um, I think your, your co-commentator is Jamie, right? It, he is, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I hope that's, that's going to work well. But from what I've heard from him, uh, I think it should work quite well. It should. Fingers crossed for you. Um, Thank you. But uh, <laughs> I, I have answered this question before. Um, everybody who knows Jack Canane, um, go follow him on Twitter. Um, 
yeah, he 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 has a podcast show, interview show called One Mic One Wheel. Uh, go and listen to that because it's fantastic. Jack, if you're listening, you're welcome for the plug. Um, but I was actually, <laughs> I know, he invited me on, and we we talked about this very thing. Like, what was the what what made you just go into commentary? And it was I. Funnily enough, the first game I played was F1 2006 on the PS2, right? And I made a, I made a long Twitter um, long Twitter thread, if anybody ever saw it, of every F1 game that I've played. Now, I did it in the order of year, not the order I played it, which is kind of weird because I started at 2006, then went back to 2002. It's a crazy, crazy spectrum. But anyway, so F1 2006 was the first game I played, and I'd hear... Um, you know, the, the two commentators, James Allen, Martin Brundle, who I actually grew up with in motorsport. I grew up listening to them. People will say, yeah, their, their inspiration is Murray Walker. A lot of people have that. That's that's nothing against them. It's a great idol to have. Absolutely. Um, but who I grew up with was uh, James Allen and Martin Brundle. And to me, they were a great duo. They had the great chemistry in the box. And even when they were going through that, you know, c- calamitous U.S. Grand Prix of 2005, they still made it a, a broadcastable thing. I mean, <laughs> the less said about that race, the better. But they showed their professionalism in the fact that they could get through a show and get through what was an hour and 20 minutes of literally six cars going around a circuit, not much battling. I mean, um, that, that, that's, that, that duo is what brought me into commentary. And I would actually, during a career mode, commentate over myself. Now, bear in mind, I was about, I must have been about, how old was I in 2006? I can't even remember. When were you born? (laughs) (laughs) When wasn't I born? Um, 2006 would have been 13 years ago. So I would have been nine. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, uh, that that checks out, right? Yeah, I would have been nine. So, yeah, a nine-year-old commentating over themselves, playing the game, it makes sense. Um, and I just thought nothing of it at the time. Then it was in the third year of my university. So this is about two years ago. Um, you know, I would um, I would go into this lecture, into this seminar, and this seminar in, in itself was was titled, um, you know, commentary, you know, the art of commentary, it was called. And we were shown this uh, this this clip of Alan Partridge in the commentary one. Can't broadcast it. It has the swear words in it, but it's very funny. Go and watch it if you haven't already. But they they my lecturer said to me, this the art of commentary is is the reaction. It's all well and good. You can prepare your speeches. You can prepare the facts. You can prepare you know, anything you want to. But at the end of the day, you're reacting to what's happening in front of you. If people like your reactions, if if you're passionate enough, then people are going to like you. People are going to like your commentary style. And I thought, yeah, you know what? I, I quite like that. In fact, my lecturer actually pulled me to one side after the lecture. And he said, have you ever thought about doing that, you know, as a as a career path? And I thought to myself, no, never. You know, 20 years old. And I finally sort of see see the light if you if you like <laughs> oh, about wow, what that's... i want to do in the future and it, it's been that um it's been on that ever since that's that's what's brought me here today i've got a full week instead of nothing but talking <laughs> and i wouldn't change it for the world yeah I, I find that interesting that at age 20 you you come to this realization that you're you're basically being pushed into it by a professor um to me, it was just completely different. To me, it was something that that really grew out of myself, and and a lot younger. I was, I think, when I did my first commentary. I'm I'm 26 now. I think I was 15 at the time when I did my first commentary, and it was, it wasn't that I was like, yeah, I want to do this. This is my my. I mean, at the time, I was a child, so my childhood dream. <laughs> <laughs> that that wasn't the case. It was more of a case of. Well, I really like this this league I used to be racing in, but I'm, I'm I don't have the time to prepare because you know school and stuff. And my uh, grades at the time got a little worse to a point where my mom was saying, "Well, <laughs> actually, gonna have to put in the work and, and you know study 
after after class uh, after school and all all of that so and to me the the idea then was well how can i help this league i like the people there i like you know i like the game which was our factor at the time um and i, I like all of this I, I have friends there and so how can i help this league well first thing i did that was age i mean it was also age 15 but a couple months before i was starting to be the race engineer for some of my friends and i was um sometimes filling in like, i was basically the guy who did everything except driving <laughs> <laughs> i was the race engineer for some of my friends i was the i was a, a steward some t for, for some races and sometimes i was even the safety car driver i talked about that two weeks ago i was the safety car driver because that game had a, a manual safety car so you could load in with your own safety car and and drive that then and so i did that sometimes too and then the the idea came that that one of the casters was wasn't able to to cast wasn't able to commentate so <clears throat> we were left with one and and he obviously wanted a second one so the the owner of the league if you will the administrator whatever you want to call it uh, approached me and said hey do you want to fill in you want to be the second commentator i was like uh, yeah sure <laughs> all right you know I, why not um and so i did that and at the end of it i m my first thought was man that was a lot of fun second thought as soon as i started to watch the stream back was oh that was horrible <laughs> <laughs> that was absolutely abysmal. I'm never going to do this again. And then um, the other commentator um, talked to me and the guy who, who uh, missed that stream, the, the, the commentator who missed that stream, uh, also watched it and talked to me. And they were like, hey, you can change this. You can change that. I was Again, I was 15 at the time. I was like, it, it, and it was in German, I, I should say. So it was in my mother tongue, but... Um, it, it wasn't good. Um, but I, 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 I stuck with it because that first feeling of, man, that was fun, that always stuck with me. And so I decided, you know what? I'm going to work on this, and uh, I'm going to try to get better and better at this. And, uh, well, 11 years later, here I am. <laughs> and here you are. No, it's uh, still it's, as we, shit as on the first one. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We we got through <laughs> one show and twelve minutes. <laughs> oh well. Anyway, um, it's always that that first commentary gig that's always the hardest. So yeah, I suppose we should we should go through some top tips uh, on <laughs> on actually liking your own commentary. I sometimes listen back to some of my commentaries because. I need to know sort of what I need to do. That's the hardest part as well, is listening to yourself. And some people hate listening to themselves. I used to hate it. When I've listened back to my first commentary gig compared to what I did last time out, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm miles better. I'm so mm. much better, so much more confident behind the mic. And that's the key thing as well, is the confidence. You need to have the confidence in yourself. You know, I am, I can do this. I'm, I'm damn good at it. It, it needs to be that, you need to be a little bit believing in yourself, but not coming across as arrogant, you know? And that comes with experience. You you sort of learn where the, the sort of divide lies and you figure out what works. Are you, uh, as you say, as you say to me every week, do you sort of lead the commentary or are you the color commentator who brings in the facts and brings in this whole fact sheet? No, looking at no one in particular, Austin Smith. <laughs> Um, but who has all the facts in the background and actually supports the, the, the main person in, well, actually, he hasn't won a race since 2015 or this is his mm. 50th appearance in this league. I mean, you know, not to brag about it or anything, Austin, but I think we make a pretty good duo. <laughs> and how has it taken 11 years for you to find the perfect co-commentator? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it pretty much only took 10 because, remember, we've been uh, together since... Uh, I think now we're in season 18 of AOR. So we started, I think we started commentating together season 16, right? Yes, we did. So it was, it's it was, been a bit. 
yeah, it was part way through season 16 because yeah. that was my first season. And yeah, I was on my own for a lot of it, um, which was fine. Um, it's it's not like you're broadcasting to one of the biggest audiences you've had so far and you have to do it on your own. But yeah, I get, I, you get used to it. You really do get used to it. And at the end of the day, when you're in a commentary box, it's you and whoever you're commentating with. And to be honest with you, that's another thing. If you're hosting and if you're having to look at the channel and upload the thumbnail, don't look at the viewer count. It's irrelevant. Don't worry yeah. about it. Don't care who's watching. Commentate like no one's watching. Have yeah. fun because chances are if people tune in and hear you, they're going to stay. And if they don't, they're going to leave. There's nothing yeah. you can do about that. Well, the the one thing I would I would say is I I I don't think it's a good idea to say commentate as if no one's watching. <laughs> because you I mean. you that I might mean. you know, but com commentate as if I, as if everybody's watching all seven. No, 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 no. I don't. I, I'm thinking about how to say it. Commentate as if only total strangers that you know you will never meet and you have never met as if only they were watching so you don't care about what they think you're gonna do your own thing but you're still gonna try to be professional you know that i think there's you you talked about the confidence confidence i think as a commentator comes from a couple of things for one and and you know that probably better than anyone um that i'm of the belief that preparation really gets you confident. If you prepare well for a commentary gig, you're also going to be confident because you always, you know, you always have something to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And then, <laughs> okay. Uh, then a second thing that will give you confidence is having a command of the language you're casting in. If you're casting in your native tongue, great. You should be good enough at speaking it. If not, if you're casting in a second language or maybe even a third somehow, I, I good for you. If you could ca if you can commentate in the third language, wow. I mean, I'm doing it in my second, but hey, <laughs> I couldn't do I couldn't do it in French. Um, but you need to have at least a command of the language that is, I would say, um, <clears throat> good enough for you to always be able to say something and bring your point across. It can be a little verbose. That's not an issue. If you're, you know, you're taking a little longer to explain, that's not the problem. I, I'm falling under the same category. Um, but as long as you get your point across and you know what you want to say and you are able to say it, you're fine. You don't need to be accent free. You don't, you know, you don't need to know every single, um, you know, every single phrase and word that a native speaker might know. That's not needed. That if if you do, great. But you have enough confidence. If you are just, if you have a command of the language that that allows you to say what you want to say, I think you pretty much summed it up. <laughs> summed it up I mean, better than I could. Again, having you know the experience of casting in in my second language all the time now, you know, <laughs> you start thinking about these things. Absolutely. Well, um, that's what brought us into commentary. Um, and I suppose we uh, we could leave that we could leave that where it is, Austin. That's, that's, yeah. That was a good starter topic. I quite like that. Next week <laughs> we'll talk about how we maybe got into commentary. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think if we want to continue this, first off, every two weeks, Kieran, don't forget that. No, so, yes, not, yes, every yeah. two weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but we next week we could talk about. Um, you just said next well, week. Yeah, like oh, oh <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> next, next show, next podcast. Uh, we can talk about where we want to go. You know, we're looking back, then we're looking forward. Um, but on the topic of looking back, 
Last week, we did have a segment that I quite enjoy talking about our favorite racing games of all time. So it was only consequential to have a segment this week, the least favorite racing games of all time. <laughs> mm. And um, I, I'm going to make the start here um, because I have something to talk about that is... Uh, Near and dear to well, it's not near and dear to my heart. It's near and dear to something on my body, but it's not necessarily the heart. Let's just say that <laughs> <laughs> if if you catch my my metaphor here, um, there is a game that was released well quite a long time ago, actually. That was to me. Maybe not the least favorite, but certainly the most disappointing. I, I look, all the racing games I've played were actually pretty good overall. I've never played a racing game where I thought, "Oh my god!" Oh, but actually, there was. Okay, I have two games to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just thought of one. <laughs> I didn't think of it in the preparation of this, but um, so the first one was, uh, and might come to a sh uh, might come as a shock to some. Gran Turismo 5. Now, I have to set the scene here, okay? The first Gran Turismo I played was uh, Th Gran Turismo 3 A-Spec. I didn't own it, though. I played it whenever I uh, was at a friend's. And, I was, and he had it, and I was playing it with him. And I, I was pretty good at it. I constantly beat him, you know, not to bang my own drum here, but, you know... Um, <laughs> But I, I really enjoyed the game. And so I bought Gran Turismo, or my parents bought for me, obviously, uh, Gran Turismo 4. And Gran Turismo 4 was, I think I said it last time, arguably one of the best uh, racing games of all time. Now, of course, for GT5, it was a tough act to follow. It, it was really hard after the success and how good it looked for it for its time on the PS2 and all that, it was really hard for GT5 to be a good game because it was always going to be compared to GT4. And that, but well, that's that's what we were talking about uh, last time out. Well, I was talking about last time out where I was talking about the new Grid game. Uh, the mm. grid reboot and i was saying that you know it's gonna be so hard like reboots are so hard to get right you've got to capture the essence of the last game but you've also got to add something new and mm. so nine there's so many countless times where that hasn't happened where the the original game hasn't been captured um and nothing new's been added that sort of it's that bizarre thing where you want the nostalgia factor but you want something new and it's quite it's 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 quite rare, especially in the video game world, to get a remaster absolutely spot on. But yeah, if you've had a game like Gran Turismo Four, you know, great game. I only played it a couple of times, but it is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, the the next game after it is just it's just going to be compared to it. And if it's even just underperforming, or if it's just, if it takes away one feature, that's it. That sums up the game. It's it's the Gran Turismo that didn't have this. That's what it's yeah. known. Yeah, mostly uh, GT Five was the Gran Turismo uh, that that didn't. I, I felt like at least didn't have um, as many cars, even though it actually had more. But it felt like it had less. It felt like it was. I don't know. It, the the graphics, even though they worked on this six years. From four to five, there was they they were supposed to release a Gran Turismo in two thousand seven, which well they did, but that was Gran Turismo five Prologue, uh, which was supposed to be a full game, then turned out to be you know this Prologue version, um, and so they worked on Gran Turismo five another three years, so six years overall, and it sold actually better than GT four, because everyone was waiting for six years for this game. To finally come out but it just for six years of difference and one console generation from ps2 to ps3 for the game to 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 not look that much better 
com- compared to its its predecessor, that was the 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 sad part for me. And um, yeah, GT five to me just felt underwhelming. And I have to say, um, Gran Turismo Sport to to really nail that that point down that you uh, or nail that point home that you made about grid as well two weeks ago um i think gt sport captured what gt4 was just in newer times and as a multiplayer and that's the new thing they they basically i feel like they just took gt4 slimmed down the amount of cars allowed it to be balanced to to have some kind of balance of performance and added some more tracks. Okay, throw out some some other ones, but you know that that's about to happen. And and release it as a multiplayer, and that's the new twist on it. GT four, you played against the AI, and granted, the AI wasn't great on GT four. <laughs> that was the one thing you could say about that game. On GT Sport, well, you have AI, but no one plays against them because it's a multiplayer game. Yeah, I, I, I got to say, I like the wording of this question, though. Um, not worst games, but least favorite. Mm. So it opens that up. My least favorite racing game, I've said it in my thread, um, on my really long Twitter thread, that to me it was because I played it on the PS2 F1 career challenge for uh, EA Sports. When, when they made that lovely, lovely game. Uh, it was just one of the buggiest games I've ever played. Not only that, but they tried to make it... Obviously, F1 wants to be all-encompassing. It wants to have as many people playing it as possible. If they can get pay- people playing the game, they could let people watch it for real. It's that stepping stone, right? So the way this tried to be done with EA was... Obviously, they, they got four seasons worth, four licenses, four seasons. That was a really good idea. Not, in fact, no, as far as I can tell, no F1 game has done that since. To me, there may have been a reason why. If you try and pack that much, considering this is PS2 for the time, to me, this game is way before its time in what it tried to achieve. You know, four seasons and a career mode that literally let you change teams. The teams would change themselves. And as you said, Austin, even the German track changed mm. in, in, from 2001 to 2002. I mean, that's, that's huge. But what it had in ambition, it lacked in, well, overall quality. It was very buggy. I remember that if you tried to pit at the same time as your teammate, there was about an 80% chance that you would be locked in a cinematic camera as you had to go an entire lap around the circuit with your pit speed limiter on. Now, you tried doing that in 2001 around the original or the the behemoth of the Hockenheim ring. Can you imagine seven kilometers on a pit limiter? It took ages. It took ages. Um, And it tried to go for this approach where it tried to attract maybe people who had never raced Formula One cars uh, in like a simulation sense. It definitely went the arcade route. And I can prove this because in that game, the slipstream wasn't actually slipstream. So if you went behind the car in front, you didn't gain speed. It filled up a boost meter. So in the top right, you'd have a boost meter that would go up and up and up. And as soon as it reached the full capacity, it would then boost you. And that's how it would work. But you didn't have to go all the way to the top. If you were in the slipstream and then you pulled out, no matter what you had, it would then deploy it as a boost. And yeah, it just took that realism away. And when it came to a checkered flag, through the last sector, you'd have the letterbox effect and the screen would go black and white. It it wasn't immersive at all. <laughs> it just took me out of it. There's nothing. There's nothing like ruining like a great result with a jordan for example than by having the game do it for you mm. and to me the, the it tried to create a game that was you know it it created the drama it created you know this surreal experience but to me it was just meh 
I mean, the game was not stable. The slipstream annoyed me so much. And you would earn credits, which then you could spend on having an, an invulnerable car for the weekend you were going to. I'm sorry. I <laughs> can't. <EA. laughs> I can't. I just can't. That's EA for you. That's the, the thing is the, the when you mentioned the boost meter, I was thinking back and 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 remembering and and I was thinking to other EA games, and basically almost every EA game has something like that. I remember the uh, what was it called the the back when EA had the license. I think they still have the license for the NBA games, but at some point certainly they had license for for nba games and they had something like a a, a a shot meter or something like that that would fill up every time you actually score a bucket you actually time it well and then after like five or so or six or so in a row that you've made without missing one with the same player um you would get like this 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 shot meter completely full which means you could suddenly do superhuman things. You could like dunk over an opponent with like, even though that opponent was like, I don't know, a whole foot taller than you. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was ridiculous. I, if I remember the story, I might be completely off here, but I think there was an NBA game that was, and it was from EA. I'm pretty sure as well. It, they, they always do this, or at least at some point they did, whether it's with the F1 game with NBA um, I think NBA Live is what the EA franchise uh, or the, the EA series is called. Um, they always do this. They always do this. And uh, it's it's kind of annoying because, as you say, it, it takes the realism out of the game. But it, look, at the same time, I think if we want to if we want to summarize this EA with any game or EA Sports at least with any game really I would say they are the masters of storytelling whether that's F1 Career Challenge whether it's um, Madden I think does a great job FIFA used to do a great job uh, at storytelling but they're also the master of bugs hmm <laughs> I mean it, it, it all boils down to what we prefer. And I much prefer realism over arcade. And I don't think you weren't going to find consoles that did realism very well. There just wasn't the capability. Yeah. So, you know, that, that that's the other thing as well, is that you realize how far ahead PC actually was because you had games like Grand Prix 2, Grand oh, Prix yeah. 3 and Grand Prix 4, Jeff Crammond, in an, in an amazing series of games. Now, I never played Grand Prix 4, and it's one of my big regrets. I never had a PC that could do it, and now I want to try and find it. Can't Apparently, it's not supported by Windows 10, or at least if it is, you have to do a lot of, a lot of background work in Windows itself to make it run. And I'm not I'm, a computer whiz. I'll say I'm, that I'm, right now. But I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a comp compatibility mode in Windows 10 still, so that should allow you to run it. Don't but I, I have I have played it uh, a little bit, and yeah, for at least for its time, man, was it good. Yeah, I honestly, I mean, even Grand Prix Two, um, you know, it, it was such a good game. I mean, did you want to take a guess at when Grand Prix Two was released? Oh. Jeez, I mean the game. Even even the game doesn't look that bad to look at. Sure, it's a bit blocky. Sure, there's a couple of pixels here and there. But actually, for its time, I'll say it right now. It was 1995 the game was released. God, I would have I would have guessed 1998, 1999. But wow, yeah, because then then Grand Prix was uh, Grand Prix three was 2000. Yeah. And then uh, Grand Prix 4, I think, was 2003? Oh, 2002. Yeah. And, yeah, that's that's one of the big regrets I have, is never playing Grand Prix 4. Mm. But we're not here to talk about our favourite games. We're, yeah. <laughs> we're not here to talk about our, our most favourite games. We're here to talk about our least favourite games. Yeah, uh, least and, favorite racing games. 
and I do have one more, as I said. And uh, I, I have a, one more as well, but it's a joke one. We'll go with your serious one first. I, it's a, it's a rather recent one, actually. Um, I think so. It has the number eighteen in its title, uh, okay. and you know it's not F one twenty eighteen. Don't worry about that. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't that bad. It was actually pretty good. Um, it's called Dakar AT. Okay. And you know the Dakar Rally, right? The, a, I, staple, I a staple of... It was a rhetorical question, but okay. <laughs> I've um, been okay, okay. <laughs> a, a staple of motorsport history, of rallying history. And it's, it's just... The, the thing is, the game itself is... It, let's say in terms of uh, in terms of realism, it's actually not that bad. It's it's fun to play, it's fun to drive, but it suffers from the same issue that you talked about with F1 Career Challenge. Just so many bugs, and the worst one, the one that absolutely killed the game for me, was that I was playing this. I think I was playing this for at one point. I was having a lot of free time. I was playing it for like 10 hours on end, just going through all the stages at once. Um, and at the end of it, I was like, you know what? I want to save this because I, I think I have one more stage left to do. I wanted to save it. And it did the auto save and it showed it was done. And I, I closed the game, closed the console, or, or uh, turned off the console. Next day, I log it, or I, I started up the console again, start up the game. The save game is gone, and yeah. all this, all this work that I put in, all this effort of trying to get, you know, trying to be good at every single stage, and trying to, you know, trying to navigate through the desert. And now it was all gone. And, and that's just something. That, look, if there's one thing as a game developer you need to get right, it's your saving mechanism. Uh, that's pretty high on a wish list, i got to say. Yeah, I'm really. Like, that's, that's just, you can't ask something that, that big from developers, right? <laughs> but that just killed it for me. The, the, the whole idea of you have to do you don't have a track with with track limits and you know you know where you're going no 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 you have a, a road book and it says the well kind of the direction you need to go in but you need to navigate yourself that is a challenge that i i just i really enjoyed and Sure, the, the, let's say the, the, the driving physics aren't the best. Um, but Well, the driving physics are, but there are some other physics. For example, if you get uh, stuck in the mud, it, it can get quite ridiculous. Um, or uh, if, you, if, you jump over a, if you jump over a dune or you, you drive over a dune, um, you can get stuck, which is good because happens to real drivers all the time in, in the Dakar rally um, if you're too slow. But sometimes it, it just weird things happen. And I once I had this, and it was on stream. I was streaming that on Twitch. I was just driving, and all of a sudden, it's as if God's foot came in from the side and just kicked my car <laughs> over to the side and just made it fly over to the side. It was ridiculous. I was just driving. I think I was driving about 100 kilometers an hour through the desert. And suddenly, I just get punted to the left side. And I, I, I'm just like, wait, what? What, what just happened? I was just driving along nicely. And all of a sudden, I see my car just flying and spinning. And how does that happen? <laughs> I, I have um, the perfect least favorite racing game of all time to wrap up uh oh um, and it is perfection because it really is the worst racing game to ever exist 
<laughs> something more buggy than F1 career challenge. Something so buggy you can't lose. No matter where you finish, you always finish first. <laughs> Wait, and what? That game is the big hit from 2003, Big Rigs over the road racing. <laughs> I've never pl- I've never even heard of that. Oh my, you are missing out. Okay, so let me let me sum this up. So the terrain doesn't exist. You <laughs> there are hills, but there's no oh, sense of deceleration right. when you go up a hill. If anything, you accelerate. Kieran, 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 are those hills alive by any chance? They might have sound. I'll, I'll, well, I'll see myself out for this one. Thank you very much. <laughs> My <least> favorite <laughs> F1-ism. Um, I know. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't like it. I do not like it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so you could go over a hill. You could climb. You could climb a ninety degree, ninety degree incline, and still accelerate. Wait, you what? Could, <laughs> yeah, that didn't happen. The, the, there were houses and obstacles all across the track. They don't exist. You can go straight through them. They don't nice. exist. And the best part of it all, where for where forward gears, you only have one forward gear. It's an automatic, but it only has one gear. Even though they're lorries, so they should have about seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> so, only one gig and it limits it, it it depends which one you drive you get a selection of five that's all well and good but then you have uh the forward gear which wherever tr- whichever truck or lorry you're driving it tops out just over 100 miles an hour for some it's 109 for others it's 106 whatever to try and mm-hmm. get with that um but they didn't think anyone would use the reverse gear so they didn't program a limiter on it no. And when I say they didn't program a limiter on it, I mean in that game, you can no. go faster in reverse than you can <laughs> forward. Nay, you can there has been there have been YouTubers who have been reversing backwards and turning either left or right to go in a circle and have achieved more than the speed of sound, more than the <laughs> speed of light going in reverse. <laughs> That just, just you know, for our, um, you know, for for some some cliches of the day, um, were the developers French by any chance? Uh, no. Okay, because no. that would have that would have explained it. But wow, I mean, to be honest, <laughs> sounds with like you, a fun game. <laughs> to be honest with you, GameSpot gave it one out of ten. Nice. Metacritic eight <laughs> percent. Eight. That is. Look, that is a feat in and of itself. Yeah, I mean, to score it that low, like most most games, most really bad games that I see score like four out of 10, 38, 41%, something like that. To get down to one out of 10 and 8%, that's impressive. <laughs> it's quite something. Um, yeah. Actually, I take that back. I now um, someone set up league racing on big rigs, please. I would I would play that all day long, <laughs> <laughs> all day long. Who needs DRS when you've got an unlimited reverse gear? <laughs> yes. Can we get oh, that in F one twenty twenty, please? <laughs> oh, and also, <laughs> here's the great thing: um, they didn't finish one of the tracks. So it crashes every time you try and load it up. No, only six tracks. One of them doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 what happens in the olden days of, you know, when there's a bug in the game. There's a bug in the game. You can't just you know release a bug fix later on because there was no internet, or if there was, you know, not everyone had it, and you couldn't just do that. Now, you know, we get these half half finished games and developers go all right here you go have a bug fix here you go have another and and problem solved i remember and you get a bug (laughs) bug fix everyone gets a bug fix yes oprah mcginley yes um (laughs) uh i remember at f1 2018 in shanghai the final corner the left hander about 90 degree left hander um if you there's this this thing on the inside, the inside of the curb. Um, a bollard, I think, is what you call it. Um, 
if you hit that before the bug fix for it was released, you just it was a wall. That thing just was a wall. You hit that, you're out. But and I, uh, actually, and I actually ran into this. And it, it ruined my race. <laughs> well, actually, because I I tend to cut that corner just so much every single time. Like I'm I'm not caring about track limits right there. Um, but you know, you hit that, and it was a wall. Thank goodness they fixed that quite quickly. But that was F1 2018 <laughs> when it was released. Well, the um, the great thing was that I remember back in F1 two thousand uh, what was it? I think it was F1 two thousand and five. There was um, there was a problem with the pit lanes at a certain track where some some of the AI would get stuck on a limiter. Now, of course, mm. this is before the time that patches, you know, were you you could download a patch. It was way before that time. I yeah. mean, online racing on it was just about starting, but it was nowhere near to what we're seeing today. Mm. Um, be lucky you have the online racing that you do because 10 years ago uh, maybe even 15 years ago it just it wasn't as prominent on console so be grateful for what you have yeah um but yeah it, so the only way they could fi fix that sort of glitch and fix that bug was by releasing the platinum edition <laughs> Yes, and that is the only way they could fix it. They had to re-release the game, but under the uh, <laughs> under the PlayStation Platinum Collection. That's the only way they could do it. Yeah, which which the the, the Platinum Collection for those that you know maybe are Xbox people. Uh, yes, we judge you for that. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Platinum Collection uh, was if you if, if a certain game sells. A certain amount of copies um i think what was it a million or so oh, five five hundred thousand exactly. something like that uh, if a game sells that much it automatically becomes eligible for a playstation platinum edition and I, for example i had i had the original version of gt4 but the disc you know was a little scratched over time uh, and so then I had to buy the Platinum Edition because the normal one didn't exist anymore. And so I bought the Platinum Edition because the, the, the disc of the original one was, you know, scratched too much. And I couldn't fix that. Um, and so, yeah, if you have a game that sells good, you get the Platinum Edition. And that game, F1 2005, was selling good, but had that bug. And that's just, that's just hilarious. Hey, we're selling the games that that well so much. By the way, let's put the bug fix in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's do that. That's quite critical. Um, here we go. To become a platinum release on the PlayStation, it was required that a game had to have over four hundred thousand total worldwide sales after go. generally about a year on the market. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was time limited as well. Yeah. And also, that was only in PAL regions. So in, in regions like Japan and US, it, if you sold 400,000 there, it didn't necessarily qualify for a platinum title. It was only in PAL regions, which yeah. is pretty interesting. But then again, there aren't many places that run NTSC, right? It's mainly PAL, so I can understand that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but <laughs> F1, to be fair, F1 2005 was a great game. It was just, you know, that, that bug was just, uh, yikes. Yeah. But Ooh. but other than that, I I love that it was the first uh, F one game that I played. Um, was it? No, it wasn't the first, but it was it was the I would say the best that I played. Two thousand six to me was in the same vein, but it was you know it was the successor, and so I grew up with two thousand five a little bit more, and so that was my my kind of thing. We've got um, someone in the chat there, Data Wasteland, saying he grew up with Pole Position. Pole Position, mm -hmm. 1982. Wow. I mean, that's um, those are those are some graphics. I mean, I guess for the Atari, it was it was pretty good, but back then, but yeah, I mean, you look back at 1982 and you look at 2019. That is a side by side comparison of how far we've come in yes. in esports. That's incredible. Imagine. Uh, <laughs> Imagine running an esports tournament on pole position. <laughs> <laughs> I would honestly look. Here's one 
for the F1 esports organizers, listen, y'all, okay? <laughs> Do a one off race, doesn't count for the championship. Look, GT Sport, the world tour, has their pro am race where they bring in, like, they, they take one of the uh, world tour drivers and they pair him with either a content creator or uh, someone from a sponsor or match from WTF1. <laughs> I'm sorry, hard. Matt. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Matt. It, it, he's probably not listening anyway, but I had to. You don't um, know. <laughs> hey, if he is, Matt, great fan. Um, <laughs> yeah, you just proved it, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously. Um, but they bring in like a content creator or or someone from a sponsor or something like that. Um, and they pair him with a driver that's competing. Uh, I think last time, or, or I think two times, or, or uh, you know, before the last episode, two times ago, um, they um, had Juan Pablo Montoya in the pro am race as an am, not the pro, yeah. obviously, because <laughs> the pros are the GT Sport World Tour drivers. But he was there as a, I think he was the sponsor or one of the sponsor representatives for Michelin. Because he has some kind of partnership with them, and or you know something like that, and they have a partnership with, or Michelin has a partnership with GT Sport, and so he was there, and um, I think he was driving with Igor Fraga, who is the reigning uh, GT Sport uh, Nations Cup champion, and uh, <laughs> it was it was it was interesting. He was driving against uh, you should know Super GT. Uh, pretty famous YouTuber, the uh, creator and uh, the one who made the Shadow Realm popular. <laughs> um, and, and also the the number one um, proponent of the rich energy meme. <laughs> um, and he and and Super GT was driving with Mikhail Hazal, who was second in the in the Nations Cup last season so that was a fight um but look gg sport has that how about f1 esports has a one-off event just for beeps and giggles <laughs> i'm trying to censor myself here a little bit just for beeps and giggles where they just throw out pole position from 1982 and go here you go now drive this <laughs> <laughs> That would be amazing. I would love to watch that. Honestly, I would love to watch it. If, but the thing is, there's probably no multiplayer on that, is there? Not even. Is there a side by side? Can they do that? Oh, <laughs> did awesome. pole position? Did pole position have a, a side by side? Obviously, you can't have all twenty. But what you could do is like some kind of timed race where everyone just goes in their own race and then they compare the the times. I can tell you race. right now. Uh, it's single player only. Okay. Which I guess for 1982 for <laughs> yeah exactly you know, the first racing games. I think you can let that slide. Yeah, definitely. I was just I, I wasn't sure, but then you have it that every every driver just races against the time, and then you see who was the fastest. You know who's the fastest one? WTF one. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. I, I, I need to redeem myself with Matt after what I just said. <laughs> I, well, oof, I don't know. Uh, anyway, we've spent quite a lot of time on this topic. Let's let's bring in a new topic. Let's let's get this rolling, Austin. We've been talking for a long, long time. <laughs> yeah, we have. We have. I, I wanted to, I wanted to to just quickly get into something because I have recently bought three. I wouldn't say brand new racing games, but you know they're a little bit older. Not that old. Not pole position old. Not even uh, Grand Prix four old. Um, we're talking two to four years. And okay. the three games I bought, one of them was Project Cars, the original, not Project Cars two. That's the current one. No, no, Project Cars, the first one. And I was playing a whole lot of it. And I have to say, considering that it's a game from 2015, so four years ago, uh, I was playing on the PS4. I have to say, it's it's a pretty good game. It's struggling a little bit. So, in terms of realism, it's it's as much of a simulation as you can possibly have. 
Um, you have the um, the uh, Motec is what it's called uh, telemetry system in there, which uh, some of you might already know from from games like uh, what was it at the time GTR two or. Uh, there was a plugin for R Factor. There was a Motec plugin for R Factor as well. Um, pretty, pretty long-standing um, telemetry system, if you will, and they've implemented that for Project Cars, and it it is realistic. It, 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 I gotta tell you, it is realistic. It, it measures the um, tire temperatures on the outside, the middle, and the inside. Um, it in in practice and qualifying it starts you off on cold tires in the race the tires are preheated because obviously a formation lap you know and um it's it's pretty realistic in that regard so the physics wow however the the, the cars sometimes behave pretty weird when on cold tires not as you would expect where they just lose grip they get twitchier which isn't necessarily what I would expect. I was I would expect them to be more, uh, you know, to be a little more, a little bit more lazy, if you will, to be a little bit more understeery. And it, sure, if they're uh, rear wheel drive, it's easier to spin, which they did that pretty well. But a front wheel drive shouldn't start to spin. It should start to understeer when uh, on cold tires. But for some reason, even that, I, I was able to spin around and only was able to, to prevent it by really just going full throttle, which that's how you catch a front-wheel drive car. Jason Plato once did that perfectly in Brands Hatch in the BTCC. I think it was BTCC. But, um, yeah, it, that is a little bit weird. But that's the only, the only thing I really have to say negatively about this game. Other than that, it's a pretty good game. It could have a little bit more content, a couple more cars, maybe a couple more series. Uh, but the track list is amazing. And uh, yeah, I, I have to, and they have GT cars and formula cars. They have a, a real sense of progression. If you want to, if you want to just straight up jump into LMP one cars, you can do that. But uh, you can have a real sense of progression, and it, it is a pretty good game considering it's already four years old. I always had a bit of a a, a bone to pick with Project Cars. It never it never clicked with me, and I it possibly could have been that I never played it on PC, which is I think the one it was supposed to be played on. Yeah. Um, so I never, I never played it on PC. So, so the console versions of it, I thought, were underwhelming. Um, and like you say, that the, the cold tires thing. I mean, with with the open Formula cars, the 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 Formula One cars that they had. Mm. I mean, you could warm up those tires till they were nice and toasty, and you'd still spin out. Yeah, and it, it didn't make any sense at all. You you could even have traction control on and still. Woof gone into the wall spun i think that's that's the annoying part is that i think with other racing games you could you could figure out what went wrong i applied the throttle too early oh i you know the back i i steered in too aggressively the back end wasn't having it i had too much ballast you know the the weight transfer was off or i'm running too much um ballast over the rear of the car maybe it should be towards the front well project cars it just felt like the, the car lost the back end because it did. And that's really the only reason I could think of, of it. Yeah. yeah. No two laps were the same with the same setup. You could take the similar lines. And yeah, I just, I wasn't a fan. It's it's yeah. not the reason why. I used to be big into like F1 2018. I used to race in it quite a bit. And then I went into commentary. I did some league racing in 2017. Um, I had a couple of podiums. Uh, I got as high as second, never won, but that was all on a controller. I never had, I never raced with a wheel. It's mm. something I want to get back into, but for now, I'm happy with the commentary side. But um, it, it used to be one of those things where you know, I I could sort of understand how the car works, but you're never going to find out how exactly it works on a controller. It's just yeah, 
how on earth are you going to find out like the finer details as well if you lose the back end on the wheel you can correct it you can at least have a chance of correcting it at least have a chance of saving it but you know that's that's all to do with the rotation of the wheel i mean i'm i've got a steering wheel right now in front of me and i can tell you right now it's rotating more than 360 degrees in fact 540 maybe even more than that you know into mm. the hundreds right but with a with a controller you've got left and right and that's supposed to represent what 540 degrees of steering yeah that doesn't work <laughs> quite literally. exactly exactly um, um I'm always amazed at how these some drivers actually drive on a controller because I like me, I don't know how I did it. I go back to it now and think I, I don't understand how I did this. I have no clue, <laughs> but um, I, I used to enjoy it. The one, you know, the, the thing that got me was I can't play the F1 games today without the racing line. And there's a really good reason why it's not that I don't know it. It's that the racing line for me changes every single lap. And I'm not talking about the braking zone gets later and later throughout a race. That I can understand, that I can adapt to. No, the braking zone is in a different place every single lap. That's how, that's how it always felt to me. It wasn't a case of, oh, it's, that's my reference point. I'm braking there every time. Mm -hmm. You could have that as your reference point. One lap, you'd lock up. Another lap, you'd clip the apex perfectly. And another lap, you'd break too early. <laughs> and I, I, think, I think that's one of the reasons why I fell out of love with it, because I, I just thought to myself, I can't figure this out. If I can't drive without a racing line on, I, there's, there's really no point in me trying to improve, because I, mm. I can't. Yeah. I'm not perfectionist when it comes to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For me, generally... I, I would I would make the comparison again because it's the two racing games that I've played the most in recent years, uh, the F1 games 2018 and 2019, and GT Sport again. And for GT Sport, I don't need a racing line because a the racing line is not a dynamic one. It doesn't show you where to break. It only shows you, um, well, what the ideal line is but doesn't give you any kind of reference towards braking or anything like that. However, you can add um, you can add these these cones, these traffic cones that will then be placed, which is actually a pretty good help sometimes because they add another reference point that you might use. Um, but at the same time, if they get knocked over in a multiplayer race by one driver that isn't you, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> so that hurts um but you know overall they're i think they're a net positive um on gt sport i have no issue learning the breaking points because what it also has and and what i think is is very important is that you can see um or you can watch rather you can watch the best lap time in the world uh, for these, what they have, they call them daily races, but they're effectively weekly races. Um, you can watch the the replay of the best player in the world right now on one lap, and so you can you can watch where they break, uh, where they steer. You can you can watch every single bit. You can I think it's it's. Um, yeah, it's 60 frames a second, and you can go through it frame by frame, which is the, the craziest thing. Um, on F1, sure, you could do that, but you can't do it in career mode. You would have to get out of career mode. You would have to watch a time trial of the fastest player in the world on that track, and then, even then, they're in the Mercedes, and in career mode, you're in... Well, 90% of the time, you're in a different car. And even if you're in a Mercedes, you might be in an upgraded Mercedes. So it still doesn't apply. And, and that's, I think, uh, the, the issue for me with, the, uh, with, with GT Sport. I can just watch someone in the top 10. Or if I'm lucky, I can, I can watch the replay of one of my friends. And they did it in the same car that I want to do it in. But... 
on F1, it's it's just not that simple. And uh, makes it really hard, I think, to to learn the breaking points. You would have to actually put the effort in and just try to get closer and closer to where the actual breaking point is. And I'm just, I, I, I just don't want to bother. You know, I just, I just want to race. And so I'm going, okay, I'm going to do these practice programs and I'm, I'm going to do qualifying and the race. And that's it. Practice programs for the progress. Uh, even though you don't have to do that anymore uh, from, from this season, you, I think you still get half the points or something like that. If you don't do it at all, which is pretty cool. Um, and so just qualifying and race and, and why bother? Well, yeah, I mean, I think for me that the reason why I stepped into sim racing and league racing for a bit of time was because career mode for me, the, the AI would be, they'd be fair enough. They'd be on their pace in their day, but there'd be certain tracks they'd be unbeatable at mm. and certain conditions they'd be unbeatable at. And it, for a time, it feels like, where's the element of error? Like, you don't see many of the AI making errors. Whereas yeah. you look at league racing, I mean, I can tell you so many errors that have happened in the past week of commentary that I've done. Yeah. I could, I could write out a list. And to me, that's, that's the whole point, is that racing is, is all about that human error, like that one lockup that costs you the win. Um, that one penalty that cost you a debut podium. Yes, that happened to me. That's human error. I sped into the pit lane. I deserved a penalty and it cost me the podium. And that's how somebody else got the podium in front of me. Oh, I know. Remember, remember uh, this uh, this Sunday, two days ago, we were commenting together um, or commentating together. I, sorry, my English <laughs> is the, the absolute best, but, you know, um, on on the AOI F3, as we always do, uh, almost always do. And um, Pedro was in his 50th race, and he could have gotten a podium, but he had a penalty. And so in his 50th race, he was, at the, what was that, at the end, fourth place. So he just missed out on the podium in his 50th AOR race. Yeah. I mean, I'll I I, I say it before, I'll say it again. I, I loved racing when I was there. And the the sort of support that i had the community behind me it was fantastic and the the reason why i stopped was because i got another offer in the commentary box and i just thought you know what i enjoy commentary just a little bit more right now and maybe there'll be one day where i get back behind the wheel um but not in the near future i'm pretty happy with what's going on and to be honest with you I, yes i miss it but also I don't miss the race when I uh, I set up my car perfectly and I was setting some good lap times and on lap one, you just lose that front part of your wing. Yeah. I don't miss that at all. Um, it feels like a wasted evening. But um, anyway, uh, we got massively off topic with what we were actually talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that, Austin, let's, let's have one more topic. One yeah, more. I, think, I think we're going to keep it short on this one. Uh, the personal moment of the week. And uh, I'm pretty sure you have one. <laughs> so I'm going to let you go first. Well, I'm going first. All right. Yes. Okay. So I have a big week ahead of me. Um, follow me on Twitter if you're not already at KSMCGF1. Don't bring up the banner. Don't bring up the banner. Oh, he's brought up the banner. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, too late. <laughs> too late. Well, um, I, I put a tweet on there with how hectic my week has been i went to a concert last night i'm doing this uh i'm doing the uh refuse to lose podcast tonight i'm doing the uh, esports mini league um tomorrow night league two on thursday i've got ttl f1 friday i am then traveling so friday's my day off but i'm traveling um to a to a little place you might have heard of it austin it's a, it's a little place called snetterton snetterton race circuit <laughs> yeah I've, I've heard of it i've raced on it in project cars i hate it ah <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be there anyway uh, over the weekend. So I'm pretty excited. Um, it's one of the, the the first gigs I've had as a freelance to go to a motorsport track. And I honestly cannot wait. Um, it, it's that mixture of nerves and excitement that I got on my very first stream, on my very first uh, time in a real commentary box in the Butmore 24-hour. 
if to me, I, I am always nervous when it's the first time I've ever done something. Because if you're not nervous every time you step into the comedy box, then it's the same as the as the race car drivers. If if they don't feel that sense of nerves, if they don't feel that energy, if they don't have their heart pumping before the start of a race, then that that probably means they've lost all all love for it. Um, you know, and and it makes sense because if, if you're not hyping yourself up for a race anymore then you're not actually enjoying it. You don't actually care. Yeah. So for me, feeling nervous is is actually a good thing because it means oh, I'm going to be so careful about what I say and how I say it. I'm going to be careful about my research. I'm going to be careful about name pronunciations. But if I waltz in there and act like I've done this all before or I've act, I, I act like, you know, I've, I've got two years experience out of my belt. I don't need this. But the experience I have is different from the experience that I'm going to get over the weekend. It's going to be like nothing I've ever done. Mm. So, yeah, I'm walking in there with with a with a bit of nerves on my shoulders. But I know once I get you know half an hour in, maybe even earlier than that, and get into my stride, then I know from then everything's going to be at least okay. Yeah, that, and, that would be my personal moment of the week. Finally, yeah. get that. Um, if, if if I may give you an advice, as someone who hasn't been on a racetrack doing commentary, but who has been out in the real world doing commentary, in my case, it was uh, fourth division soccer here in Germany. Um, I had the the uh, advantage that first time I did it was a friendly. It was not any kind of important game or anything. It was just a friendly match. Um, and so it was it was pretty chill. But uh, if I if I can give you one advice, just just enjoy it and, and take in the atmosphere. I think that's the most important thing. And then everything else will come if you if you're prepared. We we talked about that at the very beginning. You know that. If if you're prepared, um, everything's gonna be all right. Absolutely. And how about yourself, Austin? What's your personal moment of the week? <laughs> My personal moment of the week is probably going to come on Friday, your, your free day, because <laughs> that, that's what I'm going to be filling in for you at uh, One Hub Racing. And um, it's, it's only my second time at One Hub Racing. I, I did the... Um, oh, what's it called? The, 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 the highest one was Prestige, then Pinnacle... Then precision, right? I uh, always it's four it's names P. with P. It's it's, P. it's the most confusing thing. It's not. You'll get there. <laughs> it's prestige, then it's pinnacle, then it's yes. precision. So I was right. I was right. Okay. So last week I was doing the precision tier, the one right before you. Um yeah. and this time I'm doing the pinnacle, so yours, uh filling in for you. And uh, yeah, I, I gotta say I'm excited for that. Um, it's always whenever you take on a new, even n not just when you take on a new challenge, like go from from going in front of your monitor, in front of your TV, with a microphone in your own room, you go out into a commentary booth. Obviously, big step, but even just starting on on a new league. Uh, with different drivers, uh, different people running the show, you know, um, it's it. There, there's also always nerves, and um, that that's how I feel too. Obviously, on a on a smaller scale than you, I mean, man, going to Snedgerton, wow. <laughs> um, but but still, you know, I, I I have, and especially you know, filling in for you. Um, I my my thinking is uh, that I was I was watching uh, your stream on, uh, on last Friday, and as always, since you're more of a, a lead commentator kind of guy, Jamie took more of the color commentator role. Now I'm also a color kind of guy. I'm I'm more of the the expert former driver. I mean, I, look, I did have my fair share of success back in the day. Again, you know, an R factor <laughs> in sim racing. Uh, won a couple of series, got second place in a 24-hour race and all that. Um, so I think I'm pretty good for the color roll. <laughs> but that being said, um, 
two color guys won't mesh, you know. So one of us is gonna have to um, get the 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 play by play, the lead commentator role, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm a little bit nervous about how we're gonna solve that. But honestly, it's not the first time I had this this uh, fear is a little bit too much, but this this thought, this um, yeah, this thought that how's that gonna work? And and usually it always works. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know you're going to do a good job. You always do, Austin. You always <laughs> put that research in. You always put that effort in. And I'm in no doubt. You're, you, I, I'm leaving the uh, the pinnacle tier in very safe hands with you. Oh, uh, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I think. But I think I'm, right now my biggest fear is that you're watching it back and you're thinking, "Oh my God, what has he done?" <laughs> That's what people look back at me and think in like 2017 when I first started. <laughs> oh god, oh. get him off the air now. <laughs> I'm 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 pretty happy that there's no tapes anymore. It's probably on tapes, if anything. You know, 2000. Hold on, I said 11 years ago. Yeah, 2008. Um, when I did my first commentary, I'm I'm pretty happy that you know that that doesn't exist anymore. That's wiped off the internet, thankfully. Or so, so you thought, because here, live, no. <laughs> you can lose the podcast. No. Now, now I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. Now you, you've given me nightmares. <laughs> you thought it was gone. <laughs> the worst thing is if you find the, or if anyone finds the game show that I've been a part of. That, that, that sounds like a challenge. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's all all gone by now. I, I was I was I was googling it. I was searching it, and it it was gone. And, and the thing is, I know the name of it. You don't. So, and I'm not going to tell you. Hell, I'm not going to tell you. Um, I, I get it. it just sounds like a challenge. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well. Uh, I think um, we've done enough talking for today, I think. Um, and I think we should probably just wrap it up. Um, I think that was the Refuse to Lose podcast. I think it was anyway. Um, and uh, as always, obviously, we end on uh, one of the great quotes from one of the great men of motorsport, from Dale Earnhardt himself. The winner ain't the one with the fastest car. It's the one who refuses to lose. Austin, have you enjoyed tonight? Austin? <laughs> uh, uh is he hello? There? Oh, hello. I'm, I'm here. Why did my why did my microphone cut out? Yes, I, I enjoyed well, today yeah. very much. How did you enjoy it? <laughs> my goodness. I I I liked it. <laughs> At least I I like it. <laughs> um, and don't forget, you can subscribe to both myself and Austin. Here's my Twitter along the bottom. There you go. Very lovely. And uh, and here's Austin's Twitter along the bottom. Oh, beautiful. It's it, it's seamless, this one. Uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for watching. We'll hopefully be back in about two weeks' time, same time, half past seven BST. And in fact, then, actually, no, it'll be half past seven GMT. Next time we meet, Austin, the clocks go back. Yep. yep. So uh, it's half past seven GMT. And uh, two weeks maybe, time. maybe with a guest we are trying to get guests on um remember that is the the 5th of november hopefully you will be able to join us for that one uh, and as always thank you very much for listening to the refuse to lose podcast just two guys talking about uh esports and, until you all get fed up uh, <laughs> but thank you very much for watching and listening uh i've been kira mcginley and i'm austin smith take care of yourselves and we will see you next time